Today on Triad Perspective, over a half century ago, four young A&T students changed the course of American history. Two of their sons are here with me today. People from all over the world are headed to the Triad to commemorate that event. And a world-famous woman gives her take on how our lives today are because of that historic event. Today's Triad Perspective. As the a and Four, I'm your host today, Sandra Hughes, and we're excited to hear from two of their sons about the impact of the sit-in movement in 1960 that started right here at North Carolina A&T State University. I'm honored to be joined by Franklin McCain, Jr. and David Richmond, Jr., two sons of the a and Four. Thanks, guys. Great to have you <laughs> stop by and give us some time today. Thank you I for bet this us. is a busy time of the year for you, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody wants to know what it's like to be David Richmond and Frank McCain. <laughs> so we'll start with you, David. When uh, did you know that your dad was an icon? I'll say uh, when I was 18, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a uh, freshman myself at uh, Wake Forest University. Mm -hmm. Had heard the story of my dad for years, but didn't know the perspectives. I probably knew of what he was doing at six, but didn't know the real impact till I was 18. And someone asked me to come in and talk about my dad in a history class, and I felt like a substitute teacher <laughs> trying to explain what he did. And um, that's when I took a, a, a perspective of myself and and really knew what he did at 18. And I said, all I'm doing is just playing uh, college football, and he's changing the world. Yeah. Is that the yeah. same for you, Frank? When did you know how important your dad was? Yeah, prob well, <laughs> I, probably about the same age. But I, I would say that um, I realized that um, he had done something that was significant uh, when I was a youngster. Um, we used to watch 60 Minutes a lot at home. And... Um, and I remember that the TV cameras and Barbara Walters came to do a do an interview with him. Um, probably sometimes in the mid '70s would be my guess. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it wasn't until really later in life, probably about the time Chip said, that I truly had a better understanding of what yeah. uh, impact that those the seriousness of that. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. as, in case there's someone watching us now that doesn't know what we're talking about, mm -hmm. give us a quick little story about your dads. Well. Um, you know, on four, four, high, four college freshmen, um, ages 18, 19 years old, uh, my father being from Washington, D.C., Chip's father, David Richmond from Greensboro, uh, Ezell Blair also from Greensboro, and Joe McNeil originally from Wilmington, North Carolina, um, were four freshmen here at North Carolina A&T, and they were, they were friends. And um, I think they spent a lot of time, the story that they tell is that they spent a lot of time together um, um, academically, uh, but they also spent a lot of time socially trying to figure out how they could solve the issues of the world. And um, I think um, they realized one day that, uh, that in order for something to be changed, they needed to act. Uh -huh. They needed to not, um, as my father once said, um, his parents would tell him, that they, that they could be whatever, he and his siblings, they could be whatever they wanted to mm -hmm. in this world, but um, he didn't see it that way. Yeah. And, um, and he felt that in order for possibly for, for the next generation, Chip and myself and, and, and the other two gentlemen's children, for us to have an opportunity to be able to truly live out our dreams, they needed to take some kind of action now. So on February 1st, 1960, um, they courageously um, walked from A&T's campus downtown to Elm Street mm -hmm. to the F.W. Woolworths uh, and sat at the lunch counter, which at that time um, minorities and people of color were not allowed to sit at the um, segregated only lunch counter. And so their act started a movement that um, went across the United States and across the country. Mm -hmm. And that was not easy. They suffered a lot for that, didn't they, Jeff? Yes, they did. Uh, later in life, uh, my dad, he was one of the few 
guys that stayed in Greensboro, and he was uh, ostracized from jobs, and uh, and it was kind of tough for him. And uh, he knew he was a, he was a good student here at the ANT, and he did get an opportunity in the CETA program to to help people, but he knew that he could have done more. But he didn't have half or more than half of our community said, oh, great yeah. job, David, great job, Frank, yeah. right? Yeah, they would not embrace. Yeah. Yes. So uh, did, did they have a tough time because of that? Yeah, it was very, it was very tough. Uh, my father talked about, uh, as, as Chip said, they were, uh, they were courageous, but they were also very academically gifted. They were very force smart men. Um, even until David's father's death and my father's death, I mean, brilliant, brilliant minds. And, um, and Jabril Kassan and Joe McNeil are still to this day. Um, but my father told a story about how he graduated from here and um, sought employment in Charlotte. And, um, and people in Charlotte had heard about what he and his three friends had done in Greensboro. So he, in order to take care of his family, took a job as the uh, custodian oh. of a company called Hurt. Well, at that time it was called Selenese Corporation. And um, he said that one day he was cleaning the bathroom, and the CEO of the company um, came in, as he often did. But this time, for some reason, um, they had a conversation. And the CEO said to him, you know, young man, you seem mighty intelligent. Um, you know, what, what, else ha what else have you done in life? You know, are you, you seem too intelligent to be doing what you're doing. Um, and uh, or more skilled, and have you have more skills to do than what you're doing? And um, and my father explained to him that he had gone to school, that he had majored in chemistry, um, and biology. And the gentleman was like, "Well, why are you in here?" He says, "Well, because I was told there were no jobs in those fields in this company." And it wasn't a week later the CEO um, opened up a door for him to get an entry level job at a company that he would later become a senior executive in. He was outstanding. He really was. And, and I knew your dad because, uh, I hate to admit it, but I was, that age. I was around that age. So, you know, I, I joined them in the, in the yeah. sit-in movements, in the walk, protest downtown, the walks and stuff, because I was in high school. Mm -hmm. but, but your dad, too, suffered a lot of backlash for yeah. his bravery that day. He did also. Uh, and then he was a, a, a young man that had, had a son that was a after that time and trying to support a family and it was pretty tough on him and uh, he had to take whatever job he could and he also like Frank's dad was an intelligent man and he had to take what he what, what he could to support his family and he did a great job he did yeah. and, and, and you two now are I mean you're, you're both very successful in what you do but you have to, you live under that umbrella, don't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Frank, don't you oh, still, oh, for sure. you're I mean, still Frank's son. That's exactly yeah. right. I am Frank's son, and he's Hoppergrass. Yes. Hoppergrass. Son. Hoppergrass. Is yeah. that, was, was that your dad's nickname? Yeah, that was his nickname. Yeah. See, we're busy calling him Chip yeah. now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. but, um, but you're, you're exactly right. But um, I would say it's a privilege and it's an honor for us to be named after our fathers, but it also comes with an enormous amount of responsibility. Um, some self-imposed um, and some imposed by others. Um, I think that we are both, um, we're both over 50 now. I would, oh, say, at this, <laughs> I would say at this stage of our lives, um, we really have sort of come into our own and, um, and, and have a good understanding about who we are and what our contributions um, can be and will be um, for the for the community in which we live. So, how does what your dad did uh, reflect into your life? What do you have to do to make sure David Richmond still remains an icon in our community or in the world, for that matter? I, I would say, um, like Frank, uh, it's some self-imposed. Uh, it was more so my younger age that I'm like I want to do something, but. I couldn't do like right. something like him. Can't go out and carry on. I can't can carry on. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, I had big shoes to fill. But what I wanted to do is just represent him, especially that he has passed away, to to uh, carry on his legacy through through word, letting letting people 
have a personal story of, of this man that a lot of people didn't get to know. Yeah. You're proud of them, aren't yeah. you? Oh, very, very proud. And very we're, we're, um, we've, been, we've been family. All four families have been family since we have been kids. And it's an extended family. And uh, I'm so proud to be in this family. And my dad loved the other three guys like if they were brothers. And uh, it was nothing that they didn't do. Our families didn't do. Our moms. They shared uh, stories together. They traveled together. And we it's just a big, big extended family. At this point, 2016, as we move forward, Frank, mm -hmm. if you had, you and Chip mm -hmm. had to do something mm -hmm. to make a change in our world or to make it better, what would you do? Too late to sit in at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's a pretty big question. Um, I think that... Um, that we do have a responsibility to um, uphold the values and principles that our fathers fought for. So I think in this day and time, it would be our responsibility to um, do what we can to correct wrongs that are happening in our society. I don't think it always requires us, as some people think, for us to um, become the mouthpiece yes. of the cause mm -hmm. or to um, or to, uh, to create some type of plan for action. But I do think that we have to, as the young people would say, keep it 100. And keep it in 100 means that we have to be true and honest about what we're seeing and to be able to, uh, to speak against any wrongs that we see, no matter what, what the outcome is. If you could change something, Chip, what would it be right now? If you and Frank and... I don't know the children of the other two had to get together. Mm -hmm. What would you like to see done? I would say first you have to start in your community, and that's what the four started. They they didn't go out and try to change the per se world. They they saw the injustice that was going on at the time, and they saw how their their parents were uh, being denied. It, you you need to start with your community with community issues. And like my, uh, Frank said, you don't have to be a mouthpiece, but the, the, the oppressed, the people that are not getting their, their say, uh, the, the, the poor, people that are not uh, getting, people are getting denied treatment that the priv so-called privilege are getting. And I, I, I would be a champion for any cause that is, is in that, that, that cause of helping people. Yeah, we have to, I mean, I would say you have to, you have to really think about, um, I often say I need to be the voice of the voiceless. So I, I have the opportunity many times, and Chip does too, to be able to sit at a table, like a table like this, mm -hmm. and have an audience that is listening to you. So it's our responsibility that we, because we have those opportunities that we speak for those people who are living in poverty in our community. Um, those and people, can't sit at this table. Who can't sit yeah. at this table. You know, it's our responsibility to, to understand their plight and be able to try to find resolution to help them get on their feet. That's a big task, though. Oh, you it's know, a huge task. It really is. And, and this time of year, February, mm -hmm. uh, you two get very busy, don't you? Yes, mm -hmm. very what, busy. What, what's coming up for you both? Well, we have, uh, we are celebrating uh, the uh, anniversary here at a t this great university. is 50... Five years, 56. 56 I mean, since your yeah, did their thing. Yeah. And uh, this, this is a great university of great thinkers. And even before uh, he was getting on it, I knew great minds were here. And um, it's just a privilege to, to come back and, and celebrate their legacy where it started here at this campus. And uh, it's just phenomenal to celebrate it every year. Do you have something special going on, Frank, about this time? Something special that you have to do? Um, you know, this is, uh, I would say this is relatively new for me. Um, Chip's father passed, I think, in 1990. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my father passed in 2014. So Chip has been the David Richmond for <laughs> many, many, many years. And yeah, he still right. is. <laughs> he's, so, so he has been the one who's had to speak on behalf of his family. So this is um, relatively new for me. And um, yes, I have a lot of 
obligations, um, not only here at the university, um, but you know we get requests oftentimes from churches, mm -hmm. from civic groups, uh, sororities and fraternities, and you can't do them all as much as we would like to. Um, I, I'm always surprised about how people want to hear from us. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, someone someone made me realize that the other day um, that um, you know we knew our fathers better than most people. Yes. So um, I knew his public thoughts and I knew his private thoughts. Um, we are very similar, but we're also very different. So I do bring, I think, um, a different perspective, so to speak. Um, I know my delivery is a little different than his, um, but um, when it comes to being direct and on point, we're probably very similar. Well, we were totally honored that you agreed to come and talk to me today about what your dads did and about how the world continues to look at that and make changes as we see fit. Thank you so much. And, and I have to tell my viewers, I call him Chip, not David, but thank you <laughs> for pleasure. being thank with you. me and Frank. Thank you very much It's for always great us. to be with you. you. And you guys you. just keep that march going on, okay? Right. We shall. Thank we you shall. so we... very much for All coming. Right. We must take a short break now, and when we come back, hear from a remarkable woman who has carried that civil rights banner throughout the world. This is an ANT Historical Minute, and I am William Robinson. The Corbett Sports Center opened December 3rd, 1978. It is named after LSF Corbett, a 1931 graduate of ANT. Officially known as Mr. ANT, his official title was Sports Information Director. He performed many other roles on campus, including dorm counselor, and he was a member of the Board in Control of Intercollegiate Athletics. The three-story complex includes office space, classrooms, and two racquetball courts, in addition to an olympic sized swimming pool. Corbett also houses many of the human performance and leisure study courses at ANT. The Corbett Sports Center is the current home of the North Carolina ANT men and women's basketball teams and the swimming team. This has been a historical minute, and I am William Ross. Welcome back. The sit-in movement may be 56 years old, but one woman has carried that desegregation banner all over the world. Her teaching and connections with influential individuals has earned her world-renowned recognition and distinction. One A&T State University journalism student, Alan Mead, caught up with Dr. Julianne Malvo and got her reaction to today's diverse world society. The Greensboro Four, uh, the A&T Four, along with the women of Bennett College, of course, resisted uh, the status quo. And I think that when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, the young people involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, you see resistance still. I think that example of resistance is something that we have to look at. Times have certainly changed. You don't see segregated lunch counters anymore. You see Flint, Michigan, where a city that's 60% African-American, 40% poor, has water, a water quality that's abysmal, and where a governor would not dare um, have that kind of thing happen in Gross Point, one of the wealthier suburbs, but is okay with it happening in a place like that. So the whole notion of resistance, no matter what kind of resistance, is really the legacy of the, uh, of the Greensboro sit-ins. Everyone's talking about the 2016 presidential election, so I want to hit on that a little bit. With, uh, we have Hillary Clinton, excuse me, and Donald Trump leading the GOP and Hillary leading the Democratic race. Who do you personally feel is the most appropriate candidate to lead America at our current state today? <laughs> Either Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. Okay. Um, I'll tell you honestly, um, my head is with Hillary mm -hmm. and my heart is with Bernie. <laughs> and the reasoning, I'm an economist, and I think the progressive message that Bernie Sanders has been putting out there is a good message. I think he's talking about looking at Wall Street and some other things. Hillary Clinton is really uh, more of a centrist than a progressive. I mean, she, she, it's even generous to say that she's center left. Yeah. I mean, she's moderate. Um, and I think that. Bernie Sanders uh, is more, uh, more left-leaning, and I think when we look at distribution and the way that um, wealth has been so concentrated and the fact that you have so much income inequality and wealth inequality, the African-American uh, share of wealth during the um, Obama years actually shrunk, uh, closed down as opposed to expanded. So when you look at that, Sanders has a better sense of how to bring more people into economic participation. On the other hand, he has not been clear enough about how he would pay for some of the things. So he says free tuition for everybody. Well, how? And how are you going to pay for that? Um, 
different kind of health care plan. How are you going to pay for that? Um, however, I think the idealism that he's putting out there is really great. Hillary, on the other hand, she's got a bigger war chest. There's a lot of expectation of her. I think she'll be a good president. I think either of them will be very good presidents. I think she has the better chance of certainly winning the Democratic nomination, and I think certainly uh, from that perspective, a better chance of, of winning. There is nothing on the Republican side that interests me at all. Um, I think that uh, the candidacy of Donald Trump is a bad joke, and hopefully the Republican Party will wake up from uh, whatever plagues them, and they'll move on. The... Um, I can't really, I don't see anything reasonable in any of the others. But then I'm a, I'm a left of left Democrat and very clear about it. Carly Fiorina, I think at one point, was very good. I think in her first debate she did well. But I don't agree with anything uh, she says. I just like, tend to like the way she carries herself sometimes. Um, I'm looking down the list of the others, and I really just don't find anything compelling about any of them. Yeah, sorry to cut you across. I know in uh, October 2015, this past year, the New Pittsburgh uh, Courier, you made a comment toward Ben Carson, a GOP candidate, and said you called him the brother from another planet. What was your reason behind that? Some of the things that come out of his mouth are just from another planet. <laughs> uh, a Muslim cannot be president. Um, there wouldn't have been a Holocaust if the Jews fought back. Um, he talked about that massacre at that college in uh, Oregon oh. and said that people should have been armed. I mean, it's nonsensical, nonsensical stuff. My thing with uh, uh, Ben Carson is this. Clearly a brilliant neurosurgeon. Uh, I think he's tarnished his own legacy. At this point, he couldn't do neurosurgery on me uh, because he just basically has not proven himself to be thoughtful. Now, that's not consistent. Sometimes he has been, and certainly this last week when he suspended his campaign and talked about the young man who was killed who was on his volunteer team, um, I was very moved by that and moved by his sensitivity. Everybody wouldn't have handled it quite that way. He clearly is a man of God and sees himself as a man of God, but he also clearly is a, not a politician, and B, um, not very reflective about some of the things he says. There's more to come on today's Triad Perspectives. When we come back, have your calendar ready to mark some events upcoming that will continue to celebrate civil rights in the Triad and the entire world. <laughs> the North Carolina A&T State University Historical Minute. I'm Marilyn Parker. The Dudley Memorial Building houses more stone application than any other building on A&T's campus. A sweep of 15 stones guide visitors to the main entrance. Built in 1893, the original facility contained a library, an auditorium, and administrative offices. In 1930, a fire led to a reconstruction and the facility was renamed after A&T's second president, James B. Dudley. Today, the building is home to the Maddie Reed African Heritage and H.C. Taylor Art Galleries, music classrooms, and laboratories. The Dudley Memorial Building is located on the east side of campus, directly behind the statue of the A&T Four and right across from Dudley Road. Welcome back to Triad Perspectives. The International Civil Rights Center and Museum in Greensboro is an outstanding place to remember our past and look forward to our future. Joining me now is the CEO of the museum, John Swain. John, it's great to have you. How do you have time to come sit and talk to me? I fit everything in. I try to fit everything <laughs> Bless in. Bless your heart. And you Thank have you. a lot to do, don't you? Yes, there's quite a bit to do, but I understand why I'm having to do it. Okay. So uh, it's, a, it's a labor of love. Okay. The Civil Rights Museum has been in operation for how many years now? We're starting our seventh year of operation. Okay. How are things going? Are you moving like you want to? Things are going very well. Uh, I think that we've finally managed to work through some logistics, uh, get used to the building, get used to the operations, get used to the public and the schools. So uh, we're moving forward in a very good way. Well, that is wonderful to hear. Yes. I remember going in that Woolworth store when it was a little dime store, mm -hmm. getting school supplies. Couldn't sit at the counter and get coffee, but <laughs> I could buy school supplies. So that's great now. What kind of big things go on for you at this time of the year, February? During the month of February, uh, Black History Month, we have a lot of uh, schools coming through. Uh, it is our heaviest month for visitation. Uh, the staff are stretched to the limits, uh, producing programs and making sure that the public is fully engaged with any opportunities that we have. So uh, February is a great month, plus uh, dealing with the snow. 
Oh, yes. That's, I hope that's not going to hurt you this year. I don't think it will. Uh, so far, our gala was sold out, uh, and, and people were able to still come out. Uh, so it was a very nice event. And you have some big names that you honor doing those galas. This year was? This year, Oprah Winfrey received the Austin Jones Award, Bob Brown, the Unsung Hero, uh, Congressman Alma Adams received the award as a trailblazer, uh, and uh, Congressman John Lewis was also honored for the Historic uh, Achievement Award. So, You know, we have a lot of people like Franklin McCain and mm -hmm. David Richmond and the other two whose names stand out. But you've got to recognize that there are lots of people out there making changes, right? There are. There are many people who are very worthy of recognition every day. And because of that, we are looking at uh, how we can start recognizing more people across the country on the same day that we hold our gala here in Greensboro. So uh, expect some news on that okay, in the coming years. Bend my ear. Tell I will, me I will let on. you know first. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you very you know. much. Can you tell us, though, right now, about something exciting coming up in the uh, future for the museum? Absolutely. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be having a number of programs at the museum. On uh, February the 4th through the 6th, uh, we're going to have the Paul Robertson group there, and tickets are available for that. For adults, it's $25. For students, it's $20. Uh, we're going to also uh, team up with another group of uh, local A&T students to produce some interesting programs. So uh, you can see, it, see all of this on our website. And we want our no audience to know this is not just for people of color. It is not. Civil rights and human rights impact every one of us from the day that we are born until we draw our last breaths. So when we take into consideration programs for the public, we're looking at ways of engaging everyone. Uh, we want everyone to see themselves in the International Civil Rights Center and Museum. And appreciate people who are a little bit different from what they are. We have programs for everyone, and, and we do respect differences in all of our citizens. Well, we're always anxious to promote what you're doing, so Thank keep you. us in the loop. Um, if you could have a wish, a big wish today, of something you'd like to see happen at the museum, what would that be? The one thing that I'm going to be focusing on in the next year is to retire the last bit of debt Ooh. for the Civil Rights Good Museum. Luck. That's, that's tough. Well, thank you very much, but I think uh, anything that we take on, there has to be some challenges and some logistical hurdles to jump through. But the Civil Rights Museum has about $776,000 remaining in debt that we need to uh, retire with Carolina Bank, and we're going to meet that, that commitment. We have about $50,000 that so we need to retire to the Community Foundation. We're going to meet that commitment. And then starting our 2017 year, I think that you're going to see a different community asset. Um, my focus and my goal for the last six years has been on stabilization and pride of the institution because I want all of our residents here and around the state and in other states to be very proud of this one asset that changed the course of America. And you know what? We all are. I want you to know your work is well, well done. Uh, and everybody is excited about what happens at the we International Civil Rights Center and Museum. If you need us, call us. I if you will. need all of our viewers out there, call them, and I'm sure they'll come running. John, thank you so much. I know how busy you are, so I won't hold you up very thank long. Thank you very much. Great, and congratulations on all the things that you've done and will do. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us. That's all for today. I'd like to thank my special guests for helping us relive, remember, and renew our need for continued civil rights and diversity. You can watch us each Monday at 530 on Time Warner Cable Channel 69. You can connect with us on social media. Like us on Facebook at Triad Perspectives. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Triad P underscore N-C-A-T-J-O-M-C. Watch us on YouTube by searching NC Aggie TV. You can also reach out to us on our website, you know, because we want to hear from you. You can leave your comments and your suggestions. Anything you have to say, we need to hear it so we can make this show one that you look forward to seeing. Type blogs.ncat.edu slash TV studio. Thanks to all of our guests today, and thank you for watching. I'm Sandra Hughes. Have a great weekend.